Hey, John here. Let's talk about cache memory. Kind of how it works, a little bit of an introduction here, all right? So let's start by reviewing our hypothetical RISC-V 32 uh, RV32i CPU that we've been talking about, okay? Uh, the bottom line is in a single core, I mean, a lot of you know, processors, they have multiple cores or multiple threads, multiple processors and things like that. Uh, when you have one and only one core, it's the same thing as having one and only one thread or one and only one processor. Let's keep that out of the equation here. And a RISC-V refers to these things called heart, which stands for hardware thread. All right. And in a system that has a single heart, you have a single core or a single processor. OK, that's the whole point of this. Right. Single core. Uh, as we add more, it complicates other aspects of this system. But right now I want to focus on the relationship between the heart and the memory, which is what has to do with the cache. All right. So the bottom line is that we've already discussed how the the uh, processor heart of RV32i interacts with its memory to read and write values on it. Now, what we have not really talked about so far is this observation down here. When you purchase memory or manufacture it, you have to deal with, you know, uh, various factors. The bottom line is that as the larger memory uh, chips that you buy or manufacture, they tend to run more slowly than uh, smaller size memories. You can make, in other words, you can have uh, small systems that run fast or large ones that run slow, roughly speaking, for any given price point. You know, if you have an infinite amount of money, you could buy a whole lot of smaller ones and group them all together and make a big one out of fast small ones. And uh, you'd probably have a faster system, but it would be physically very large, use a lot of power and be kind of impractical. I mean, there's just a lot of factors behind this whole thing. The bottom line is the practicality is you can get a large, low system or a small, fast one. And th that is the essence of what's going on in driving us to want to build a cache, which you're going to see is a small, fast memory to complement this large, uh, slow memory. All right, so let's look at the same thing again, but we're going to add a cache to it. So where does it go? It goes between the, the uh, hardware thread and the memory, all right? So again, this is going to be uh, small and fast, relatively speaking, to the large and slow main memory that you might have in your computer. Again, this could be gigabytes. This is on the order of megabytes, all right, in a realistic system. Let's start with some terminology. When we're dealing with caches, we, deal with, we, we, we refer to things that have, that have to do with tags and lines. The way this thing works is that a cache is going to keep copies of various parts of the main memory. All right. That's really how the, the whole point of this thing. Make copies of things that are slow and keep them in memory that is fast. So you can interactively and repeatedly uh, access the items from the fast memory rather than chronically, repeatedly uh, accessing it from the slow memory. So how does this really work? Well, in the simplest to understand style of cache uh, architecture and design, what you have is a line of bytes, all right? You want one byte or 10 bytes or however many bytes you want from memory. You get it from memory in size of blocks of memory, okay? Blocks of bytes of memory. In this dialogue and this discussion of caches, we're going to assume that our cache line size, and all the examples I'm going to give you, is based on 16 bytes, all right? Now, some caches might only have 8 bytes. Some of them might have 32 or even longer bytes. It doesn't really matter. One of the themes you're going to find is that however big this line is, is always going to be a power of 2. If it's not, you've just made a lot of work for the hardware designer, an enormous, colossal amount of work. Keep it simple power of two, all right? So what is the point? The point of the line of bytes is to keep the copy of the data from the fast slow, or from the big slow memory uh, stored in, in, in the cache. Anytime there's a transfer of any kind from the main big memory into the cache or vice versa, it will be done in a unit of one whole line of bytes. You don't just move one or two or something from here over or from there over to the memory. No, it's a whole block of line, a whole uh, line size block each time, all right? So what's this tag all about? Well, when you build a cache, again, the simplest one that I can conceive of is you create a, you know, a, a series of lines, a whole bunch. Of, it's like a two-dimensional array. We have 16 bytes per line, and you have, you know, whatever, you know, 4,000 lines. 
Somebody has to remember where all those lines of data came from. Simple as that. That's what the tag is for. A tag is essentially the address. Okay. Oh, this line of bytes maybe came from main memory at address zero. All right. Could be anywhere. The next line in the cache would say, hey, here's 16 bytes of data that were copied out of memory for use by the you know CPU core, the heart, the thread, or whatever. And it might have come from uh, address, you know, one hex, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or something like that. Okay. That's the, the definition of a tag is essentially an address. And we'll see that this uh, comes in a variety of flavors. Okay. <laughs> As we look at different kinds of uh, ways that caches can work. While the line of bytes is simply the line of bytes. This doesn't vary a lot other than its size from cache design style to design style. Let's look at an example of a cache line in, in the corresponding tag based on the terminology we just talked about. So let's say our memory has a 32-bit address, okay? Like the, the, uh, the uh, architecture that we've been talking about so far in this playlist, the RV32i, okay? Let's say our line size of our cache is 16 bytes, like I said before. Now notice that the number of bytes in a 16 byte cache line can be expressed using four bits of binary data or one single hex digit. All right, this is gonna be handy. We're gonna keep this sort of thing in mind. Therefore, the tag size need only be 28 bits. We have a 32 bit address. Our line is going to hold 16 bytes. And as I said, no matter what, whether I want one or 10 or two or four bytes, it doesn't matter. The line will always be filled with 16 bytes of data from the main memory. Therefore, all we need to do is remember the address of the first byte in the line. Now, uh, for, again, for simplicity's sake, we will always fetch lines of, of data for the cache that are aligned to the size of the line itself. And therefore, the address of the first byte of any cache line here, because it's 16 bytes long, will always end in a zero. Every line in a design based on a this length cache line, that will be true. Therefore, if I wanted to grab a byte out of memory at this address, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, what would happen is the cache system would fetch 16 bytes starting at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, zero. In one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, A, B, C, D, E, F. Inside this line will include that byte number eight right here. And to remember where this line came from out of the memory, the tag need only store one, two, three, four, five, six, seven because every line in a cache that is designed using these criteria right here will always start at a 32-bit address that ends in a zero. So why waste the extra bits in this tag? We simply leave it out. Those four bits in this scenario is referred to as the offset, right, into the line, right? So that eight right there would represent the index in this, if it were like a C array called lines, line sub zero, line sub one, line sub two, and so on, then line sub eight would be right there. All right, extending this example to a practical actual cache, what we need to do is make one small leap further. Now this is what we call a fully associative cache where any line in the cache can contain a copy of any memory address or, you know, a copy of data from any memory address, I should have said here, perhaps. Okay, and why? Now, what does that really mean? Let's ignore this over here for a minute. So let's say we have a whole bunch of lines. In this example, I'm going to have 4096 lines, 4K lines. We'll get there in a minute. Each one of these lines has its own tag that's independent of any, every other tag. And if they're all 28 bits long and they all end in this, you know, hypothetical zero over here, right? So this is a, like a seven digit hex value with an implied zero after it that represents the first byte in each of these lines, right? Well, therefore, any line can have any value tag. And if this tag is zero, for example, that means that this byte here is, is came from the main memory address zero, because it's zero, 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 
plus the implied zero for the first byte in the 16 byte line. And this would be memory address one and two and three and four and so on up to F. Okay, and if I wanted to fetch another line out of the memory, from the memory address hex 10, or hex 10, I should say, and the cache system wants to put it somewhere, it could put it here, it could put it wherever it wants to. It doesn't matter. Why? Because the tag for that line of data that in this scenario would come from hex address 10 in the main memory, as long as the tag is set to 1, that indicates that this line came from memory at address 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and so on, up to 1F. And you can fill up your entire cache with all these different lines of memory and put them in any order anywhere you want in this cache. That's fully associative, okay? That means that the tag has all the bits in it that it could ever need to allow any line to have any address from memory. This will make more sense when we talk about other kinds of caches, right? Again, this is the easy one to understand. You might say, in contrast to what? Well, we'll get there soon enough. So this tag says where it came from, and this is what it got from there. Now let's look at a little bit bigger picture here. Now, uh, when you boot up a CPU and you've got it, let's say you have a cache that has 4096 lines in it. Remember the zero here, right? Zero through this in decimal is triple zero in hex through FFF in hex, okay? Now, if you build a cache like this that has four, what we call 4K lines in it, and you first turn on your CPU and it starts fetching instructions and stuff, well, the cache is full of garbage, right? There's nothing in here. You know, what would you do? I'll just set all the tags to zero. Well, that doesn't make any sense either. That would be really confusing. If you ever have the same tag in more than one line, then which line should the system use? That's like, a, you know, don't do that. That's not an allowed uh, situation in, 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 a, in an associative cache. That's like really bad. Don't do that. So how do we get around this? Well, we have these extra two bits over here. D stands for dirty. And we'll get there soon enough. And this one is valid. All right, the valid bit is the one we're talking about right now. If the valid bit is set to 1, that means that this line has data in it that came from memory and that this tag is meaningful. If the valid bit is 0, that means this is garbage. Don't look here. Don't use it. It's junk. Okay, So when you boot up a cache, what really happens is all the valid bits are set to 0, and you don't care what anything else is in the cache at that time. It just simply means if you want to use any of these things, you better go over to the main memory, fetch a bunch of stuff, fill in the tag, load in the cache line, and at that time it sets the valid bit. Now, quickly, the dirty bit is used for uh, if the CPU ever decides it wants to write a value into the memory. Now, depending on how your system is set up, the CPU can actually write it into the cache line here and not bother to set it out into the main memory, or at least it might not do it immediately, okay? That has to do with what happens when your cache is full and you need to load more lines out of memory. What do you do? Well, this is pretty important. If they're all valid and they're all in use and you decide, I'm going to recycle this one here, line number zero or line number two, and if that dirty flag is on, the CPU knows that this line had been modified and it needs to save that line back into the memory before it recycles this thing and uses it for something else, okay? That's the, what the dirty and the valid bits are for on a cache line, all right? And this, again, is a fully associated... This example, the, all, the examples we've talked about so far, are what we call a fully associative cache. And that is solely based on the fact that this tag here allows me to go ahead into memory and get any lines worth of data I want and store it anywhere I want in this cache. So to wrap up the main points of a fully associative cache, what do we know? These observations, one, it's like a, finding a needle in a haystack. You've got thousands of cache lines. Each one of them has a separate tag. You must check every single valid tag, right? whenever you're looking for a line of data for uh, some specific memory address that you want to access, right? So every single time you access this thing, you've got to check every one of those tags. That's kind of a lot of work. If you can't find one with the tag matching the, the address that you're looking for, 
for. You got to go to the main memory and load it from there into the cache. Then you can use the data out of the cache to finish the operation that you want to work on. That's really how it works. If there's no room in the cache when you want to load something in there, you got to pick one of the uh, of the lines and throw it away and recycle it to in order to load it from memory and then use it, okay? And then you run into the situation where eventually you've got all these dirty lines in your cache, and now you need to write the thing back to where it came from before you then recycle it. So what is the takeaway of all this? Well, this is definitely not trivial. It'd be a huge pain in the butt to get it all right. Just picking which line that you want to recycle when the time comes is a major undertaking. Right? There's all kinds of algorithms and things like people use to keep track of all this stuff. Nothing is trivial. When you want to increase the performance of a system, the bottom line is you want to go faster, you got to get more complicated and take care of more things. You got to address the needs of the machine as you try to increase the performance of your applications. All right, so let's look now at the exact opposite of a fully associative cache and what's called a direct mapped cache, all right? And we're gonna see in a direct mapped cache, that what we're gonna do is, first of all, you're gonna see the tag has fewer bits in it, okay? And uh, the other, the, the, the big issue about a direct map cache is that rather than allowing any memory address to be, you know, uh, uh, any block of memory, right? So I want to, you know, fetch some line of, uh, uh, of data out of the memory. I can't just put it anywhere I want in a direct map cache. Right? So the number one differentiating factor between a fully associative cache and a direct map cache is in a fully associative cache, any line can be stored anywhere. In a direct map cache, we'll see based on the math down here, that any line can only be stored in one and only one place in the cache in this design. Well, what is the value of that? Again, bird's eye view, all right, before we get into the details. If I want to fetch some byte from memory, and the design of this system is such that that one byte can only be part of one line, and that one line can only be stored in one row, one line of my cache, if I have, you know, four... 4K rows, 0 to 4095, or 0 to triple F in hex, right? If we can only go in one and only one of these lines, I don't have to look for it. All I need to do is say, well, if that memory location can only be stored in address 2, and we'll talk about how we figure that out down here. If and only if I want to grab a, a, you know, some data out of memory, and I want to ask, is it in my cache? And the rule says you can only be here based on the address I'm looking at. That's how we're going to see this is keyed. Then I only got to check that one tag right there. I don't have to check 409, six separate tags in this massive operation. Obviously, this is a little bit simpler, right? But as we'll see, it's a little bit more limited as well, right? If you can only store a given memory address line of, of data in one line in your cache, in theory, it, it, you can start to see that, well, what would happen if you constantly need to use this line when you're you know, not using other ones, you know, based on just the coincidence of what memory addresses are used in your program, all right? Now, if you're gonna use a fully a, a direct map cache in a system, you gotta be a little bit more aware of these things, or you could just ignore it and let it be inefficient, but, um, we'll see that the hybrid of the two is where we're really heading, all right? So I'm jumping around a little bit to kind of give you, a, you know, just to give you a reference so that we know what we're talking about here in contrast to the uh, uh, the fully associative cache we just talked about, all right? So this is where we're heading. Uh, direct map cache, if we given it uh, any address in memory, we're going to see that uh, there's only one place for it to go in the cache. It simplifies the machine massively. Okay, so what do we look at when we had a fully associative cache? We had this notion of a tag and an offset. Now we have a tag and an index and an offset, right? Well, the offset means in here the same as it did before. The offset is which byte in our line represents the byte of this address, of the memory address that we want to uh, go out and maybe read, okay? The tag still means the same as it does in the associative cache, but there are fewer bits in it, all right? And we've introduced this index. What the heck is that about? Well, 
if we put a 12-bit index right here, we split our memory, right? We got a 32-bit memory address. The last, the least significant hex digit is the offset. The next three hex digits, right? 12 bits, four times three, three hex digits. We're going to call an index. That's the row number over here. So given any memory address, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 1, 2, 3, 4 is the tag. 5, 6, 7 in hex is the index. 8 is the offset. So this index here, in this example, 5, 6, 7, there's one and only one line where this tag could ever be used. And that would be line number 5, 6, 7. All right? If we want to read something from that address, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and we're using a direct map cache, we must look at line number 567, check the valid bit, and see if the tag here matches. Then and only then, does this line hold the data that represents this memory address. Okay? So look closely at how these things are grouped. We put the index here, and we are, say, fetching instructions. You're just going to execute code, not looping or anything else, and you're just going to run through memory one word at a time. What's really happening here? I'm going to fetch a byte or a word, I should say, from address zero. Tag zero, index zero, offset zero. Well, it means it would have to be in this line up here. If it's not, it would go fetch out, read in the line, and we'd read the first word off of this line here. Of 16 bytes is four words, right? So you'd get four instructions. If you start executing at address zero, it would come bing, 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 bing on the first line. As soon as you get to address zero, 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 one, zero, right? Hex address 10, right? The, like the second line of, in a dump, in a hex dump, right? Uh, it would have to fetch another line out of the main memory. And when that happens, this index value will be one, the tag will be zero, the offset would be zero, right? You're, you're fetching a, a, a full word if you're executing instructions on an RV32i from address hexadecimal one zero. The index is one. It must be in this line right here. There's nowhere else for it to go, okay? The offset, of course, would be zero. So you're going to fetch the first byte or bytes from that line there. And if the tag here, which is zero, matches this one and it's valid, you're ready to go. If it's not, you're going to have to recycle this line right here and fetch that and fill that data in here. It cannot go anywhere else because this index is welded to this line number over here. This is the hallmark of a directly mapped cache. One and only one place can any memory uh, value ever be placed in this cache. So let's look at the kind of a conflict that we run into, right? Well, anytime the index is a 1, you know, zero, zero, 001 in hex, that line, data that holds the, the whatever that memory is, must go on line one because that's the index number. What's going on over here? So what does that mean? All right. So these addresses that I'm going to write on here all must be stored in line number one, or otherwise the you know you have to recycle it and throw the other one back and, and reload it. It's nowhere else for it to go. So what happens here? We got 16 bits. That means any any address at all that has four hex digits here of any value followed by 001 followed by anything over here has to be on row one. I mean, that's just how this thing fits right in here, right? So obviously 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 5, or 0, 1, F, you know, C or 1, 1, F, C, I should say, 0, 0, 1, you know, 8, everything, no matter what. If there's a 1 in these three digits, it must go online. If there's an 050 on this thing, it must go on line 050X, all right? There's only one line that could ever be used to hold any memory address, okay? And because of the way the tag works, we could easily ask how many different memory uh, lines could be stored on this cache line? Well, the answer is obviously 64K, right? 16 bits is FFFF. Convert that to decimal and you get 65536, which is 64K.
or one with uh, four zeros after it in hex. Okay, that's the total number of different memory areas that, that each cache line of real memory that would only be able to go right here. Okay, so that's 64,000 possibilities that are all conflicting and trying to, you know, uh, get in this one line. Yeah, if you use a system like this, obviously, it would be a good idea not to store all your data at addresses that all have 001 in here with different values over here. You would have the <laughs> never-ending conflict and contention to want to reuse this line. You'd like to kind of scatter them out in memory a little bit. Like I said, if you're going to fetch memory and execute instructions in order and continuously run, look at what happens when these addresses all count. It turns out that the high order digits here will always stay the same while this thing goes from 000 to 001 to 002 and so on, while these digits go from 0 to F, 0 to F, 0 to F. As these go up in order, what will happen is each one of these lines will fill up in order until you get all the way down here to the bottom of the cache, assuming we're only uh, fetching instructions in order as we do what, what is commonly referred to as a memory march, you know, in, in continuous increasing addresses. I think you can see, uh, hopefully work that on your head or pause the video and draw yourself up some diagrams to convince yourself that that's really what's going to happen as this cache fills in one line at a time. Once you get to address F, 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 and you add one to it and you're still fetching, you end up back at 000, zero, zero here. You'll have a carry over here, right? So this will go from 000FFF zero, 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 F, 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 right? You add one to this and you'll end up at zero, zero, one, zero, 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 right? At which point in time you would have wrapped through all these lines and back up here to line number zero. That would be the first time that there would be a need to reuse this line. Again, if and only if all you're doing is executing instructions and they were branching and stuff like that. In a realistic program, there's some randomness to interacting with memory that can kind of disrupt this a little bit. Uh, there are systems out there, realistic and practical commercial systems, that do use direct map caches. As long as you have enough lines in here, you know, the contention isn't too bad. But as a programmer, as an architect, a system designer, an operating system or something, you need to be somewhat cognizant of this, or at least consider it from time to time to make sure that your data structures don't end up in a situation where you're always accessing something that has the same index number with um, varying tags all the time, because you can end up with all this contention, right? I mean, that should just make sense, I hope, once you kind of think and reason all this out. So... Observations for directly mapped caches, right? Given any given memory address is one and only one cache line that can be used to contain its value, right? Or the line of memory that needs to be cached from that address, okay? Plus side, it eliminates the complexity of searching every single tag in a needle in a haystack kind of fashion like the associative cache requires us to do. Simplifies the hardware, cuts cost, cuts energy consumption and everything else. However... We have contention to worry about any given line, you know, depends on the uh, um, pattern of how we interact with the memory addresses, right? You can come up with a sequence of, 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 of best case and worst case scenarios. As I point out, the best case scenario for a direct map cache is a system that marches through memory in increasing address order continuously. That's a great uh, use of a memory uh, direct map, I should say, cache. If it's purely random, you might end up with trying to recycle any given cache line more often than you'd like to, right? Of course, the direct map cache also has to deal with all these other things as well. Uh, you know, the unique thing about the associative cache is a needle in a haystack kind of a situation, but it's flexible. But these items down here, no matter what kind of cache you're using, no matter what, if you can't find what you're looking for, you got to go ahead and go back to memory and read it in and load the cache line. If there's no room, you got to find one and throw it away and recycle it. The one that you want to throw away as a dirty bit set, you got to remember, oh, golly gee, it's been modified, so I better save it back into memory before I try to reuse it and read anything new in on top of it. And again, this is not trivial, and it's all part of it. what you need to do if you want to increase the performance of a system. It's just that the direct map cache, if you think about all the gates 
that you need to compare these various values in the tags is going to use a lot less uh, gates and transistors and things like that. So what do we got? Fully associative. We got direct map. Now we have an N-way set associative cache, right? What are we looking at here? Think of this as a direct map cache for starters, all right? It's a big fancy name. We're going to see that this number N here is determined by playing games with this index, all right? So uh, we're going to end up with a hybrid is, is what we're going to see. This is going to be both direct mapped and associative all at once, all right? So this is really similar to what we were just looking at for the diagram of the direct map cache, except for some of the numbers have changed. I've circled them in red over here. So what happened? Let's uh, take a quick peek back at the direct map cache. When we take the memory address that we want to refer to, we break it into the tag and the index and the offset. In this example here, the index had 12 bits in it. Those 12 bits were exactly the number of bits needed to specify the specific line, uh, cache line number of the cache memory over here that uh, within which you must store the line for this memory address. Look what I've got here. Jumping around a little bit, I know, but let's make sure we keep our eye on the ball. This index has 12, this one has 8. That tag had 16, this tag had 20. What's the difference here? I stole four bits out of the index, moved them over to the tag. It's the only difference in these two diagrams, okay? Don't let that subtlety get past you, all right? That's the whole difference here. Well, what is the implications of that? That's another story, okay? So what do we got here? We have a 20-bit tag that matches this. The tag from the me the number of bits in the tag field from the memory has to equal the number of bits in the tag over here. Otherwise, you can't compare and match them, right? Again, some of these observations I really didn't point out directly, but uh, uh, if they, if they've gone over your head, think about what's going on here. All right, make sure that you get all this stuff. Otherwise, you know you'll miss something. All right, so by shrinking this index. From 12 bits to 8 bits, and otherwise, like not changing my cache, really. Okay, well, I did added more bits here, but we'll come back to that a little bit. We still have what 4096 lines in this cache, and that's the key. Same number of lines, same number of bytes in each line, right? The offset is still four bytes, okay, or four bits, I should say, for 16 uh, total bytes over here. Line numbers are the same, 0 to 4095 in decimal, 4096 total. Index only has 8 bits. We cannot represent all 12. So what we're really doing is we're saying the index is just two, that's two hex digits here, right? I made everything here a multiple of four so we can speak in terms of hex without having to do the bit stuff in our heads here, right? So what do we got then? Eight of these 12 bits are being specified. So given an 8-bit index, I'm not specifying one line. What if the index is 0, 0? Well, I'm really specifying all lines that start with 0, 0, followed by whatever, right? Well, how many lines are in this cache that start with 0, 0? Well, there's 16. There's 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 1, 0, 0, 2, 0, 0, 3, 0, 0, 4, and so on up to 0, 0, F. That means there's 16 lines in here if we take this index and we use it to match the left two hex digits. Now, in theory, it doesn't matter in the cache what it matches over here, but uh, for simplicity of discussion, let's assume that the index represents the most significant bits of here, and the least significant bits are uh, like wildcards, okay? Simply because they're not specified, this index doesn't tell you what they are. When you have a situation like this, and this index represents, in this case, 16 lines, we have what's called a 16-way set associative cache. The 16 right there is defined by absolutely nothing other than the difference between how many bits are in this index here and how many bits represent this line number. In this case, the difference is four bits. We can specify eight of 12 leaving four ambiguous bits in here, which represents these groups of 16. So the set size in this set associative cache is 16 lines. And because there's 16 lines in each set, and we're going to see in a second, any one of these 16 lines 
This index number can store any uh, memory address, any line from memory that has the index set to zero, zero. All right, so in stark contrast to the direct map cache, this has to have a three digit index in here. And given any individual three digit index like 001, there's one and only one line where any memory uh, data can go that has that value in here. Well, this one over here only has the two digits and it could go in any one of 16. And we use the tag then to figure out which one it is. Where the direct map cache says the tag is go and no go and there's only one line that it can be in, this says the tag is now a lot like the associative cache, but rather than checking all 4096 total lines, we only need to check 16. So that's why this is a hybrid of two. It's the best of both worlds. You can directly map your way out of most. You don't have to search the entire haystack for that little needle. We've divided a massive haystack of 4096 places to look into 256 separate uh, uh, um, haystacks, right? And each one of them now only has 16 places to look. Again, it's a hybrid of two. It gets rid of the all the conflicts that you're going to get with the direct map cache that you could run into uh, while still giving you some sort of associativity. So the N-way Set associative cache, the N has to do with how many cache lines are going to be in each one of the sets. And the number of sets is defined by the size of this index. So this is 256 sets of 16 lines each. Okay? That's really, that's everything. Okay? Now, in order to really work this out in your head and think about it, you might want to take a couple of uh, addresses and kind of write them down and break them up into pieces and kind of see how all this all fits together. Now, there's a nice Wikipedia page with a different kind of set of diagrams and a little bit different discussion if this isn't good enough uh, for you to get a mental picture in your head. I'll put a link to that under the video uh, if you want to get more information out of that. Personally, this is how I think of all this stuff. It's just bits and groups and which ones are there, which ones are left. Um, uh, ambiguous and how they get grouped together. To me, this is all I ever really needed. Um, if you want more and you want more diagrams, like I said, Wikipedia is not really a bad place to look, all right? So let's look uh, back here and kind of uh, get a bird's eye view at uh, these extreme cases, just an enclosure here, right? So what does it then mean? We have a, a direct map cache that we saw before. You can think of that as 4096 sets of one line each, right? You really can. Either 4K sets of one line each, or it's just simply 4096 lines, right? So technically, it, we wouldn't be wrong, I think, to say that it's a one-way set associative cache. A direct map cache is really a one-way set associative cache. Now, uh, you wouldn't normally say this. You would just simply say it's a direct map cache. I've never heard anyone say this before, but I think technically this is not wrong. It's just the extreme example. You would also not say something like this. However, I don't think you'd be actually wrong in doing so. The fully associative cache that we saw earlier, let me see if I can find my diagram for that one here. Oh, these are the bullet points. It would be more like this line example, right? Maybe getting some circular closure here. Maintain our notation, right? What's not in this diagram? The memory address example. How does this thing all fit together? Remember, we keep on saying the notion of a tag and how many bits it has. And we have an index and we have this offset. Right? Well, the offset's been four in every one of these because the four bits represent the 16-byte uh, line size, which one's in here? Well, in the extreme example of a fully associative cache, the index has zero bits in it. That's the takeaway key of a fully associative cache. This memory address, if it's 32 bits, what do we got? We got 28-bit tag and a 4-bit offset. That's why the tag up here had 28 bits in it, right? Well, in a uh, uh, direct map cache, again, if I find this other diagram, look what happened here. We snuck an index, we stole bits out of the tag to represent the, the line number. We put as many bits as we could put in here. 
line number needs 12 bits, we put 12 bits in there. Extreme one-way direct map, that index represents number of bits per line. Extreme uh, case for the other way, the fully associative cache, the index has zero bits in it. All right, so what does that really then mean? When you have as many bits as you need for one line, there's only one way, there's only one place for any given line to go, that's a one-way set associative cache. Fully associative cache, when you don't have any index at all, what you really have is only one set with all the lines in one big set. And remember, the set has to do with it, how many bits are in the uh, index field, right? If every single line is in one set, then there's 4096 lines in this example, then you've got a 4096-way set associative cache. People would not normally say this, though. They would simply say it's fully associative. And this is more meaningful, because if you told me I had a 4096-way set associative cache, I wouldn't know, quite honestly, if it's fully associative or not, unless I knew how many total sets there were. The fact that there's one and only one set is what dictates that this is a full associative cache. All right? Just to connect all this terminology together so that you've got your, you know, your bearings uh, as you try to navigate all this stuff. So what then is the total takeaway? Some systems, a direct map cache is perfectly fine. Other systems, a fully associative cache is perfectly fine. There's different costs in picking either one of these two. There's a hybrid of both we call an n-way set associative cache that gives you the best of both worlds ultimately it depends on your application some cpus have a different cache for data as they do for instructions and an instruction cache might have a direct might be a direct map cache or it might be maybe just a two-way set associative cache if you're going to do these long memory marches through memory fetching instructions more often than any other thing than getting closer to a direct map cache or something with a two-way or a four-way set associative cache might be all you really need. Save money. But if you have a lot of data and you're accessing it very randomly in sparse places all over the machine, you may want to have more ways to represent those cache lines to, to, again, to reduce the number of times you have conflicts when you have to, you know, recycle a cache line because the set that you have to put it in is too small, okay? Again, all this boils down to the application, how much money you want to spend, and all this other fun stuff. We'll come back and see more about caches once we start talking about multiprocessors, multi-cores, and level 2 caches, and things like that. So I hope this introduction is enough to give you a toehold to pick up and read articles in places like Wikipedia, or even processor specs, and make sense out of how their caches work and why they work the way they do. Thanks for watching. See you next time.